on behalf of center for equity studies i welcome you all to the uh, webinar uh, the this is the fifth edition of the webinar on the pandemic on the pandemic uh, on the pandemic and equ uh, equity series today we will be talking about what does the con uh, drastic contraction of the economy mean for, uh, mean for the indian laboring pool before we go into that we are going into a dark times in our democracy where uh, where we could we could see the police without even questioning or even taking into ground the people who have actually carried out the uh, riots or uh, have created hate among the people leaving them and they, them all aside today we have the, they are arresting all the democratic voices which have stood for the constitution which are standing for peace and which are uh, which are standing for the peace we, we all start with condemning the delhi police and in solidarity with all the political prisoners around uh today we uh, as of now in india we we all know the indian gdp in the april to J, uh, june 2020 quarter has contracted by 23.9% and this is also uh, where when the informal sector is not be inform informal sector is not been uh, factored in if we include that it would be much higher um, and it would uh, according to pranab sen's estimate it would go around to 32% The, uh, the, uh, the finance minister in one of the statement talks about it if, as if it's an act of the god but we can see that before the pandemic in itself the indian economy had been contract been contracting and it has grown just, just with 3.1% in the last quarter in 2019 and 20 in the low, the lowest in the seven years and with the uh, strict uh, with stringent lockdown this crisis uh, this crisis has further precipitated in order to have this discussion today on the drastic contradiction of the economy and what does it mean for the indian laboring poor we have eminent professors with here today professor jan primman he is an uh, is an eminent sociologist and emeritus professor uh, professor of the university of amsterdam and a leading scholar of labor in india he has written extensively and with empathy and insight written on the informal labor in india their past and the present Renana Jabbala has led the iconic Seva, the largest trade union of women, and has been active for decades in organizing women into organizations and trade unions in India. Professor Prabhat Patnaik is a renowned academician, author, and political activist. He writes on the political economy of labor and capital. He was former professor of economics in JNU. Our Professor Nagraj is uh, the professor at the Indira Gandhi Institute of Development Research, Mumbai. His areas of research include aspects of India's industrialization. applied macroeconomic issues public sector performance the, indi uh, the industrial labor market in india and official economics economic statistics he has been actively criticizing the production of misleading statistics from the current regime along with exposing the issues with the jobless growth professor vikas ravan is a professor at the center for economic studies and planning jawaharlal nehru university delhi he is an eminent scholar who has focused on land and agrarian relations in india he has conducted several field based studies examining the impact of the economic changes on labor and other marginalized section professor vikas raval also recently conducted uh, field based studies of the contracting of the economy job loss and how different people have been suffering during and after the lock during and uh, in the unlock phase uh, now i request harsh to continue and start off the uh, it's a conversation about uh, people who who care and who think deeply uh, uh, about this moment and i think Uh, we all need to put our both our minds and our hearts together as india faces probably what is going to be uh, the greatest humanitarian crisis uh, in the last half century uh, perhaps longer perhaps in many of our lifetimes um and we we, we are witnessing uh, huge stories of 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 uh, joblessness of of hunger of uh, of a sense of despair about the possibilities of life getting better uh, in the near future and even in the medium run uh, i believe that policy choices that have been made uh, may perhaps uh, leave their impact for even a full generation uh all of all of us have been uh, are naturally going to be hit adversely by the shrinking of the economy uh, but 
we really need to think very hard about what is happening uh, and what will happen to the masses of the laboring poor. What we must understand is that the immensely ill-advised strategy of the severest lockdown in the world with the smallest relief package not only unleashed an intense state-induced catastrophe of human suffering, of hunger, joblessness, and dislocation, and the severest recession that India has suffered since independence. India continues to scramble as infections rise because it is not able to organize its public health infrastructure even so many months into the pandemic. But the unkindest cut of all is that many independent and privately many official experts agree that India's infections show no sign of ebbing precisely because it opted for the strategy of the most punishing lockdown in, in human history in the name of fighting the infection and preparing for its rise. I fear, as I said, that the people of India will endure the disastrous consequences of these failures for at least one generation. India suffered its first economic contraction of 1.2% in 1957-58 because of the need to import large quantities of food to border famine, resulting in a balance of payments crisis. Recurring droughts and food imports brought, brought us to our next great contraction of 3.7% in 1966-67. Oil shocks caused the next two contractions of 0.3% in 72-73 and 5.2% in 7980. Uh, India is headed for a much larger contraction this year. Uh, uh, I, at the moment in this uh, quarter uh, for which we have, have data, 24% uh, uh, contraction uh, is based on just reports from the uh, uh, formal sector of the economy. Uh, Pranab Sen, uh, India's former chief statistician estimates that uh, the contraction would be closer to about 32 percent and for the overall for the full year it would possibly ar be around 13 to 14 percent i don't know what each of you what your estimates are about the future but as as, as maybe a, a hundred million people can be expected to lose jobs the debilitating impact on the food livelihoods and health of millions of india's poor appear to be calamitous. We will ask also, how did India arrive here at this place in its journey? Uh, they, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic was probably to a degree an act of God, as the finance minister maintains. But the cruel lo lockdown with a relief package of less than 2% of the GDP, contrasting with 13.2% in the US, 7% in China, 11.8% in Brazil, and 20% in Japan were conscious policy choices. As Prime Minister Modi thinks it fit to post photographs of him feeding peacocks and reading a newspaper as ducks walk by in his spacious green garden, India stares at a bleak future of a more extended period of runaway infection than perhaps anywhere in the planet. Of what I believe is the beginnings of a creeping invisible scattered famine and of years of prolonged mass hunger and joblessness. All of this in a climate of, of, of the shrinking and, and the further shrinking uh, of, of, of democratic freedoms uh, in this country, uh, the suppression of all voices of dissent. And, uh, and behind all of this, a communal project targeting India's minorities, particularly India's Muslims. Uh, this catastrophe, to me, appears to be the direct outcome of leadership of hubris and of narcissism with an almost pathological absence of compassion. And it is in this context that we thought we would turn to uh, some of the finest hearts and minds uh, that we have to reflect on, 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 as I said, what is the nature of the crisis that we are seeing, what brought us here, what can be done, uh, not just by the government, but uh, uh, beyond what the government can do uh, or will do. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and it is in this context that we would all be 
uh, meeting and uh, discussing today. What are the consequences of this drastic shrinking of our economy uh, for specifically India's laboring poor and uh, for India's destitute poor? Uh, I work with homeless people um, for the last two decades and, and, and they are the laboring poor, but they're also so, uh, uh, you know, uh, so far from any kind of uh, of a, a job of certainty, security and dignity, even in normal times. So for the laboring poor, uh, uh, at various stages of vulnerability and precarity, what are the consequences of this drastic shrinking of the economy that you foresee? How bad do you expect the impact to be? Um, how long do you think it will last? What will it do to, to their lives, uh, to their capabilities and to uh, their prospects of survival? Uh, uh, may I start with uh, 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 Professor Jan Bremen, uh, who's I think uh, probably longer than many people in the audience, uh, uh, their entire lifetimes. Jan Bremen has been studying and, and writing as a uh, with great empathy uh, and insight about uh, India's laboring poor. Uh, and he's joining us from Holland. So, uh, Jan, would you like to uh, start off the discussion? Uh, and I'm glad to participate uh, in it. Uh, and uh, I look at the kind of uh, uh, commonality between the panelists and uh, presumably also uh, those who participate. Uh, Harsh, you talked about uh, democracy. Uh, and basically, all of us are speaking up for democracy. But the irony is that, that uh, those voices of ours are understood as dissenting voices, not as democratic voices. Uh, it seems that uh, those who speak up for democracy nowadays are accused of uh, being anti-national, of betraying the, the, the cause of the nation, uh, so to say. And that is alarming, that is disconcerting, and that doesn't make it easier for, uh, for uh, politicians and policymakers to solve problem of dire poverty and progressive uh, poverty. And uh, we have to understand the current situation under the pandemic in the time frame, of course. And we have to realize that uh, people now sinking in poverty in which they were already well entrenched. It's not a new phenomenon for them. And they desperately uh, uh, tried, uh, uh, very courageously tried to get out of it in various ways um, to uh, basically apply what is now called self-reliance, which is uh, coping for survival. Uh, but uh, we have seen, and I'm only talking about the last couple of years, but poverty is of long-standing, of long-standing uh, 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 danger to the nation, I would say, uh, a long-standing uh, danger to the nation. Uh, but in the, in the last few years, we saw the demonetization, which is still, uh, what shall I say, uh, seen uh, from those in the seats of power, as uh, as having be have uh, as having had a positive uh, impact, and we know of all of us around the table and also among the audience that it was not a success. It was a brutal failure, and it increased the misery of the people who were already poor. After that, uh, the introduction of the uh, GST, the Goods and Services uh, Tax. Uh, added to the crisis. So the pandemic is part of a trend, of a longer trend of increasing poverty, which we cannot call poverty anymore, but destitution, the word for destitution is pauperism. And what we see is the face of pauperism. What I find striking, uh, Harsh, if you ask us, what has been the impact of the pandemic, that we learn so little 
of how the poor are coping at the moment in the, where they have been driven back to in their so-called home, be it uh, on the outskirts of, uh, of the cities or to back to their villages. And we have seen how the government has washed its hands of those who were footloose, how they were driven back basically to be with the household to which they belong and from which they had opted out in order to make a living. That is not possible now. And what happens to them? We have, not, we have uh, a, a lot of information about the, the traveling back to home, but we do not have much information on the dire plight of the people which are now not poor any longer, they are pauperized. And I think that the word pauperism should be understood because it has a reflection in history, in social history, of course. And we have to go back to that literature, to that knowledge that came about that pauperism was, what shall I say, the reaction of the government then in the West to the predicament of the poor, not alleviating their poverty, but driving them down to further, poverty, uh, to further poverty in, in a pauperized uh, condition. And then went along with a, an ideology, which I find back now, an ideology of social Darwinism, where it is the survival of the fittest that counts. And those who are not able to cope, it basically says that they are not self-reliant anymore. And then the rights of the citizenship are taken away from them. That's the situation of the pauperized lot country. Thank you, Jan. Uh, you know, you 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 really startly uh, uh, underlined uh, that even in normal times, people live and and struggle often courageously with poverty. But what we are seeing now is their slippage from poverty into pauperism. And you believe that that is uh, actually uh, not an accident. It is, it, it is, uh, uh, it, it is a conscious uh, uh, outcome of, of policy choices. You've also underlined that whereas for a while, while uh, we witnessed the distress of returning migrants, uh, for a little while, their suffering was, uh, you know, knowledge about that and information about that was available to all of us uh, in the middle class. Uh, but uh, what has happened? How are they coping when they have returned home? We know less and less about. So, Renana, uh, may I come to you next? Renana is, uh, uh, works with uh, probably the largest uh, collective of working women in the world. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I think has her, both her ears and her heart very close to the ground. Uh, and so how would you respond to the questions that I opened up with, uh, Renana? Um, <clears throat> thank you, Harsh. And uh, I uh, would like to actually focus, uh, I, I'd like to base on experience somewhat and focus more on the women. Yes. Uh, because we talk about laboring poor, but uh, women are a very big part of it, even when they are not counted. Uh, <clears throat> and when you ask this question, how bad it is, how, uh, how bad it is, how long it will last, what is the impact? So, of course, one could talk about the last three months, but we do realize that this is going to last for a while. Uh, I think the macroeconomists can talk more about how long. Is it going to be a year, two years, longer? But I would like to, uh, so I was thinking, how do we, how do I say uh, what the impact is going to be? And uh, <clears throat> what, I what I remembered was that you, we went through this financial crisis in 2000. Uh, eight onwards and in a way this is very comparable to that or what is going to happen of course the last uh, six months has been much 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 worse so that 
a shrinkage of 30 percent, 33 or 30 percent, uh, was really the effect of the lockdown. But as the economy does open up, uh, there is still going to be um, <clears throat> a shrinkages. Um, and uh, I, I sort of looked at a survey we had done in 2009 on what has happened during that last year. And one thing uh, which I do need to say is usually people talk about jobs lost, but um, as you know, mostly in the informal economy, it's not really only jobs lost. Of course, people completely lose their jobs or completely lose their livelihoods. But it is a decline of incomes, a decline of number of days which have worked, the decline in prices that you receive for your products. So I just wanted to tell you something of what we saw in 2008. This may be worse. Um, we, you know, we don't know maybe, uh, but just what we saw in uh, that one year is I'm going to go over the different areas. So a lot of the women were working in construction. Uh, 30 to 40 percent, this was a survey we did in three states, 30 to 40 percent found that they had no work. Construction really collapsed as it is collapsed now and will very slow to pick up. And the rest said that they had less than 10 days work. So they also said that there was a decline in the daily wage rate up to about 25 percent. So uh, <clears throat> some people had some work, but they had much less income. Some people had no work at all. Small factories closed down, a lot closed down. 20% of people said that they had no work. 40% said that it was less than 15 days. Um, and the small factory people said that they had lost all working capital, that there were no export orders, and there was a slowdown in domestic demand. Again the same things that are going to happen. Women home-based workers, there was a 60% decline in the amount of work that they had. Um, as they are saying now, that at that time also they said that agriculture has not been hit. Uh, and that's what's being said now, that agriculture is still doing well. But what we saw then was that there was a decline in the prices of agriculture produce. So though people were, the farmers were producing, um, there was a major decline. Um, <clears throat> what was the effect? There was a reduced consumption of food and especially people stopped eating vegetables uh, and meat, of course. Um, a lot of people did not go to the hospitals or for medical treatment until they became very, very ill. 70% went into debt. And a large number uh, took their children out of private schools. Some withdrew their children from education altogether. And like now, but much less, of course, there was an increased migration to the rural areas. So this is what we saw happen. And this is what we expect uh, this year, at least this year, uh, that there'll be reduced incomes, there'll be reduced work, uh, what we are seeing even now is that in a family one where there were three people working, there's one person working. So um, given the kind of malnutrition we have, given the kind of anemia we have among women, we're going to see much, much more of that. And it's going to really be difficult. Thank you, Renana. I think that was very, uh, very, very sobering. And my guess is that uh, it will be much worse than in 2009 because we actually chose to shut down the entire economy, uh, the entire supply, entire demand of the economy. Um, and uh, the economy was already slowing down. Uh, but I think your reminder of firstly about thinking about women workers who are even in the best of times uh, invisible uh, and, uh, and struggling. Uh, and, and the many things that you spoke about, uh, the expectation that work opportunities will reduce, incomes will reduce, uh, food consumption. And here, you know, from my conversations, 
uh, around food, I've seen that it, it goes, it, it's going in three stages. Uh, the first is that, uh, as, as, as Brennan had talked about, the first stage where people start reducing uh, the, uh, uh, the more expensive, which is also the more nutritious parts of food. So vegetables, meat, eggs, milk, uh, those start reducing uh, and, you, uh, and you're eating sometimes uh, roti with, with salt and so on. Then at the second stage, the actual quantum of, of even that very basic food uh, starts declining. And we've seen signs of that as well. Uh, and uh, and that people are going down, eating less, and reducing the number of meals. Uh, you know whether we've really reached the third phase, which is of people, much larger numbers of people sleeping hungry, is something that we are trying to find out at this very time. Uh, a collective of us from across the country are trying to reach out to uh, to various communities, including persons with disabilities, single women and others to find out what is the situation with regard to food. Uh, but uh, what you had observed in 2009, re reduced food, uh, especially nutritious food, uh, decline in you know, taking children out of school, uh, seeking health care only uh, you know, uh, uh, when you have to and sometimes not even there. I think the human, uh, the granularity of the human distress uh, that uh, the slowdown you know, these figures of 23%, you know, 24%, 30%, what will they mean to people's lives? I, I, I thank you for, Renana, for reminding us. Uh, and I turn to Prabhat, who's, uh, you know, who's, whose insights and wisdom about uh, the Indian economy. Uh, uh, I am not alone in, in, in drawing a great deal on, on learning from his insights. So Prabhat, where do you see uh, what, where, uh, and what is going to happen? What is happening, and what do you expect to happen to India's labouring poor uh, in this time of economic shrinking? Thank you, thank you, Hirsch. Uh, you know, almost everybody is agreed that the current year, not just the first quarter, but the current year as a whole, is going to witness a substantial contraction in the GDP. The figures vary from 9% to 12-13%. Uh, and this contraction is going to give rise to a significant amount of unemployment. Again, the figures vary, but the minimum would be about 50 million unemployed at the end of the year. So on this question, the fact that the laboring poor are going to be very badly affected, not just because of the close down, but also in the sequel to the close down, there is a general agreement. But most people believe that, all right, this is a year in which things have not worked out well, the pandemic is still continuing, but next year would be better, or two years down the line, the economy is going to recover, that there's a general feeling that the economy is going to recover after a certain period. I believe that that is not necessarily the case. That requires certain very specific kinds of intervention in the absence of which the economy can actually go on and on and on downhill. Let me just give you uh, uh, some reasons why I believe so. During the pandemic, there has been among, I mean, suppose, let us say next year, investment comes back to the level where it was in 1990, sorry, in 2019-20. Consumption would still be somewhat lower, even though it may be higher than this year, it will still be lower than 2019-20. Because meanwhile, during this year, People have got into debt to maintain whatever consumption they uh, uh, were maintaining. Many of them have actually run down their cash reserves. In other words, vast numbers of households have really got into debt, which is what of course, Renana also talked about. And in the process, they would like 
to devote a part of their incomes whenever these incomes come into their hands to recovering their position, paying back some of the debt, rebuilding some of their cash reserves and so on. Therefore, their consumption cannot possibly absorb the incomes they get because of which it would remain subdued compared even to 2019-20. Now, investment again cannot really, I began by saying let's assume, but investment again cannot really be at the 2019-20 level because exactly the same thing has been happening to small marginal enterprises, to petty producers. They have also got into debt and this debt is something which should actually prevent them from going ahead with investment. Even if they get some cash into their hands, they would be under constraint to pay back the debt. Therefore, investment again cannot really recover to the level of 1920 in the coming year. If that happens, then the overall level of output would not recover to what was there in 2019. And if that happens, if there's a shrinkage in output, which is not only in the current year, but even subsequently, in that case, you'd soon find that investment would begin to get cut. And as investment begins to get cut, then consumption begins to get cut. And that in turn in induces a further cut in investment. Therefore, you would have the economy going downhill. So it's not a question of whether we recover in one year's time, two year's time, three year's time but really that the economy would be going downhill and downhill and down. The way to kind of prevent this is through the injection of purchasing power by the government, through the injection of demand by the government. You mentioned the earlier contraction, for instance, during the two oil shocks, mid-60s, in the foreign exchange crisis in the late 50s and so on. All those were periods in which India was a planned economy in which the government was really duty bound to maintain its expenditures. As a matter of fact, its expenditures took a knock because of these external shocks. But the moment the shocks could be somehow absorbed or overcome, the government expenditure was back again at a fairly high level. But this government is not one which is actually cutting, you know, which, which actually believes in reviving expenditure. I'll give you an example. The 24% fall in GDP in the first quarter of the current year, as you know, the government sector, that is civil administration, defense and public services, has itself fallen by, by 10%, 10.3%. Now, the point is, whenever the, the economy is contracting, typically the government maintains its expenditures in order to cushion the impact of this contraction. If anything, it may raise the expenditure to counteract the contraction. But as a matter of fact, we have a situation where the government itself compounds the contraction, which is what economists talk about government expenditure being pro-cyclical rather than anti-cyclical. Now, this is what the current government believes, because in a period of contraction, taxes go down, and if taxes go down, expenditure also goes down, like had happened in, in India during the Great Depression of the 1930s. Therefore, since this government is not going to intervene, my fear is that the economy would not just take one or two or three or four years to recover, but the economy, in fact, may go down and down and down. Therefore, it is essential for us to actually make this point that in the absence of government intervention, the economy is going to suffer because of which the laboring poor in particular are going to be very badly hit. Thank you, Prabhat. I, 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 I feel uh, that every word of what you what you foresee um, and your foreboding is 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 uh, is extremely is completely accurate, uh, but that spells a very very dark future. And you know when we read about the Great Depression in in the United States uh, and the suffering that it it uh, it, it it led to uh, among the poor for 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 a very extended period of time. Um, and, and, and that the government's uh, fundamentalism, in a sense of, of 
uh, of, as you're saying, uh, pro-cyclical rather than uh, anti-cyclical sort of in, in, in interventionist uh, interventionism uh, makes the prospect extremely grim. Uh, so, Dr. Najad, may I turn to you now and, 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 and how do you see uh, the present crisis? Uh, what is your understanding of it? Thank you, Hirsch. Can you, can you hear me? Can everybody hear me? Yeah, yeah. thank you. Okay. Yeah, I, I uh, thank you for this invitation. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, as, uh, as it was mentioned earlier, we, we know that economy has contracted by 24% in the first quarter of the current financial year uh, compared to the same period last year. Uh, as some people have said, and I agree, this, uh, this number could be an underestimate because uh, the estimation of informal sector output in GDP in India is very poor. In fact, the quarterly estimation itself is, is very poor and particularly the informal sector, they are broadly you know, rates and ratios applied. Uh, so uh, there is very little primary data used for quarterly GDP estimation. Uh, so I won't be surprised if the actual figures would be much higher than 24% as uh, some other have also said. Okay. Uh, uh, output shrinkage of 24%, uh, one can expect simple, uh, uh, that there will be a corresponding decline in employment. Uh, roughly speaking of the same order and uh, organized sector employment is relatively better protected organized sector or formal sector relatively better protected not all of them though we know from the cmi data the organized workers the organized sector workers have also lost jobs but the bulk of the the fall in employment would be in the organized sector as we all are aware of that. Uh, so uh, output output contraction employment contraction are a uh, you no, know, are bound to uh, to follow one another. So, uh, did the government respond to the crisis? How did the government respond to it? The distribution of some food grains under PDS, distribution of free food grains under PDS, allocation, rising allocation on NRAGA. Uh, uh, this has happened. We know that in, in the month of May, the government announced a major uh, Atma Nirbhar uh, package. Uh, but we all know that uh, most of it was uh, uh, was uh, loans and uh, concessions, but not increase in public expenditure. Uh, so actual additional public spending uh, in the Atmanirbhar package was, as we rightly estimated, is about one percent of GDP. Uh, so this has hardly added much to. Uh, much to demand. Uh, okay, so I think the uh, the total quantum which is uh, supposed to reach the 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 needed of the relief pa package was small to begin with. Uh, uh, just to give an idea, I think most other countries. In fact, the IMF's own study shows that India's package has been, in fact, the least among the smallest among all emerging market economies, uh, forget about the advanced countries. In fact, there are estimates for, for Vietnam and in even Bangladesh, I'm not sh sure the Bangladesh number, but I'm sure the Vietnam number, that even they, their fiscal stimulus in the present crisis is far way better than, than India. It really shows how conservative Indian government has been with respect to this. Uh, then, then question is whatever is allocated, allotted, have they reached? Has it reached the poor? And here I think you know the people from the you know report on the ground uh, show that very little of it, or not, say a, a large part of it, hasn't actually reached the reached the intended uh, beneficiaries. So the real benefit of it to the poor in terms of protecting uh, incomes or you know taking care of the humanitarian crisis is probably uh, limited. Uh, yeah, uh, and one thing the NRAGA seems to have relatively done better. This is my understanding. I may be wrong, but my understanding is that since it is a demand-driven, it's a self, uh, it's a self-selected program. The uh, workers who were who who were pushed out of the urban areas, went to villages, demanded this. 
And I understand from the newspaper reports that there's been a rise in the number of uh, people demanding job and, and getting it. So therefore, the, whatever is allotted for NRAGA, the additional allotment, seems to have been used up to a substantial extent, which is a, which is a good sign, which is a good sign. Though the quantum of allocation may not be as much as many, many scholars would, would, have, would, would like to have, to have seen. Okay. So this is a, though the government has responded to criticism, but what they have done is, is, is missed. Okay. Uh, but on the, uh, one silver lining to the entire thing is agriculture. So food waste production is likely to be good, despite the, despite the, uh, the excess rains and floods in large parts of the country. My, my guess is that overall food production has increased and demand for labor in agriculture would have correspondingly gone up. So to that extent, to that extent, it has been a, uh, it's been a, you know, it's, it's a silver line. Okay. But let me also add a caveat here. Production might have gone up, but has it reached the, the consumer and therefore have the farmers realized the income out of it? Here, I think there are serious concerns. Uh, uh, I think the government's estimates of agricultural GDP is at the, uh, at the, at the farm gate level. We are not sure of the prices, but uh, the Monday prices seem to suggest the prices have collapsed. Okay. Whereas the farmers, whereas the consumers in the cities are paying much higher price. This has happened because of the disruptions in the, in the, in the, in the transport and uh, uh, transport uh, system. Uh, so who has who has benefited? Nobody. I think the uh, in, increased agricultural output probably probably will improve self consumption of peasants. Okay, but the uh, people who wanted to sell it in the market, they probably have not realized better prices. And of course, the urban consumers are paying a much higher price for because of this. So the overall welfare gains of uh, of uh, Agriculture is probably much less than what the government GDP estimates for agriculture show. That's why. Okay. So I think the overall effect of uh, of uh, of the pandemic and the lockdown is very severe on, on the it's, it is a on the on the laboring poor, and uh, I, there are lots of field reports uh, about which uh, many of the other panelists know better. So I think overall things have been been far worse. When you compare it with other other countries, I think India's situation is far worse. Yeah, I would stop here. Maybe I'll come back later. Thank you. Yeah, Professor Rajaj, I thank you, and I think uh, we'll come back in the second round to some of the questions about what uh, you know, which you talked about, what the government did, could have done, and did not do. Uh, but some there's this almost irony that. That if India's economy is being saved, it's being saved by that sector of the economy which has been the most neglected uh, for, for, for decades, which is agriculture. Uh, but also, I mean, and when we come back uh, again, I I worry about whether you know the next phases of the intercrops, uh, you know, horticulture, whether uh, you know milk, all of this, uh, you're going to see the same kind of uh, of uh, of productivity. And, and of course, the questions of marketing, of income, and so on, uh, would remain. Uh, so Vikas, uh, your prognosis uh, for the present and the future uh, for the laboring poor. Okay. Before I come to what's happened, uh, you know, during uh, this period of pandemic and the lockdown and, and subsequently, let me just sort of make two points about the, 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 the conditions in which this happened. And I think there are two things that we need to understand. One is that uh, we had already been into a fairly prolonged process of, of economic distress and in particular of agrarian distress uh, preceding before uh, any of this happened. Uh, you know, the uh, FAO has these sort of international surveys on food insecurity, which showed that in 20, between 2017 and 19, something like 500 million people in the country were living with moderate to severe food insecurity. So, so, so basically 50 crore people in India 
were were living with uh, with uh, moderate to severe food insecurity food insecurity in india increased from 2014 to 2019 uh, it increased by 3.7% while interestingly in rest of south asia prevalence of food insecurity declined by 0.5% Okay, so we we were already living through a period where, where food insecurity, agrarian distress had intensified. The second thing is that we have already we had been going through a phase in which government had been systematically destroying our statistical system, and this is something on which people like Nagraj have written a lot. Uh, but you know, we know the story of what has happened to NSSO surveys, NSSO employment surveys, consumption surveys. estimation of poverty gdp and uh, you know uh, anything that could uh, tell you uh, about about living conditions of people in this country was essentially stopped so you know now that has a bearing on what we are getting to see after the lockdown and i would like to you know uh, uh, i think my interpretation of what has happened particularly in the context of agriculture because that's the sector that i really look at uh, is uh, somewhat different from what nagara just mentioned uh, you see i we have uh, been doing village studies since the time lockdown started we collected data from 44 villages across 18 different states we have been putting together massive amounts of secondary data downloading 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 you know uh, crazy amounts from uh, whatever uh, websites we can get hold of uh, official websites we can get hold of now if you take the data on mandi arrivals total quantity of arrivals and you take the price at which this this produce was sold between last year and this year taking everything together and i have downloaded data for every commodity for which data are available on agmarknet website which covers 300 different mandis and we have downloaded everything that they have over the first quarter total value of produce fell as compared to last year fell by 35% you see the total value of produce sold by farmers was down 35% now this is a period in which you had cyclone uh, umfan you had desert locust you had uh, 60% of the country had uh, what is called uh, extremely you know highly excess rainfall you had hail storms in large parts of the country now how is it that you are saying that agricultural production was unaffected from this in fact if you look at the the press release of uh, of the government in which the quarterly estimates were released they say estimates for for milk fish egg poultry are based on production targets so they essentially just put what they thought what was what was what was their pre covid target for this quarter as what has been achieved they have no data about it it doesn't reflect anything of what has happened and you know there were any number of media reports of how farmers were forced to sell their forced to abandon their abandon their perishable uh, crop on the on the streets they were forced to dump poultry produce from uh, dump eggs and so on so the massive destruction of crop produce happened during that period of lockdown in particular the finance minister is on record having said that there was a decline in decline in uh, in demand for for dairy produce so you know how is it that then you come up with a number which says that indian agriculture agricultural production has not only grown it has grown faster than it grew last year in this quarter so you know it's just basically huge amount of window dressing that has been done it is it does not reflect the condition of the ground it does not reflect anything of what we have seen it does not even reflect the data that government has has released during this period for example on the uh, produce that farmers were selling so you know i think what thinking of agriculture as a sector which is providing some kind of relief in this period is i think grossly uh, overstated this is a period in which farmers are going through severe crisis and their ability to you know employ 
you know extra workers because workers have have lost jobs i think are, are are seriously limited you know there's so much that they can do so so and in fact i think there is going to be this is a period in which you could see great increase in farm indebtedness and farm distress so so you know thinking that agriculture can sort of push the economy in this period i think is is, is an idea that's being being overstated uh, that's that's essentially what i want to say at this point Thank you, uh, thank you, Vikas. I think uh, again some very important reminders. Firstly, that you said that India was already uh, sinking deeper and deeper into food insecurity uh, in in the last five years, uh, unlike uh, our much poorer neighbours. Uh, you uh, reflected on uh, the the propensity of our government, the present government, to hide. uh bad news with 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 hiding data and and so uh the worries about that but i think most importantly you talked about uh that uh, you know uh, uh, the idea that agriculture as a sector is going to save the economy uh is is, is perhaps uh not so well uh, well founded <laughs> i go to the second part which is what brought us here and i think some many of you have talked about it what uh you know there are many people who would argue that uh no you know they, this is a global trend uh, uh the whole world is facing a recession india is just reflecting a, the same global trend uh the virus is substantially responsible and it's an act of god uh to what extent is is that is that justified how much of what we are seeing is really the result and of policy choices and what are these and here i wanted to really start with prabhat because uh, i was looking at some of the questions uh, also in in, in the uh, chat box and there's a certain you know the question is that why is the government not making these choices uh, it's it's bewildering that the government is refusing to put more hands in, in, in more money in the hands of the poor which would have dealt with the immediate distress but also been good for the economy uh it's hard to understand why the government is choosing not to do this and is it that we don't really have the elbow room uh, that these are choices that are not feasible for the government so prabhat if if you could start off uh, uh you know about what has led us to this situation and could the government really have done differently i was saying that there's plenty of elbow room because even though vikas will be right in terms of the fact that the peasants are getting 35% less value for whatever the monthly arrivals of crops uh, but at the same time the government does have very substantial amount of food grain stocks as a result immediately if the government engaged in putting money into people's hands purchasing power which is financed entirely by a fiscal deficit that would not have any serious inflationary consequences uh, oil prices are low therefore there will be no cost push inflation either from that side and we have plenty of food grain stocks and of course unutilized industrial capacity the system is obviously so severely demand constrained that the government can with impunity engage in deficit financing until the economy has recovered somewhat after that you can raise taxes and i would of course advocate an increase in the wealth tax uh but at the same time the reason why the government doesn't do this okay i think there are two different aspects to this question one is why doesn't the government do this the other is how is it that the government is allowed to get away with not doing anything of this kind now here i would like to say that you know we often talk of democracy the fight for civil liberties and democracy and so on essentially as a political question quite separate from the economic crisis the economic issues as a matter of fact the government will be forced 
people to take cognizance of this and would be forced to put purchasing power in the hands of the people and would be forced to do things which would alleviate people's distress if the people are in a position to march on the streets, if trade unions can go on strike demanding that various things be done, if agricultural, uh, if peasant organizations, like cultural labor organizations can actually get onto the streets, okay, at the moment there are problems about getting onto the streets because of the COVID-19, but at the same time, there is a pervasive atmosphere of fear. And I think this fear and this oppression of democracy also <laughs> prevents people from uh, taking to the streets and fighting for rights that would actually rectify the economic uh, distress to which they are being subject. Why does the government not do this? I, I think that's a, that's a very important question. Mind you, in many, <coughs> in many advanced countries, for instance, during this very pandemic, governments have taken measures to alleviate people's distress. Measures, for instance, in terms of temporarily nationalizing private health care, providing, as we have heard, providing relief packages substantially higher than what India has done. But I think in the case of India, there is a kind of kowtowing to the dictates of finance, which is unparalleled anywhere else in the world. I mean, I think our government is far more subservient to the dictates of finance. Because, you know, in finance, as you know, does not really like large government in the involvement in the economy, doesn't like uh, large fiscal deficits, and therefore the government kowtows to them. Now, every other government has actually shown some spunk in actually providing relief to the people, even by running up huge public, uh, huge fiscal deficits. Uh, but on the other hand, not the Indian government. In that sense, the Indian government is far more subservient to the dictates of global finance, international finance, than any other government. I think their thinking is derived from that of finance, and that thinking carries the day because people are not allowed to march in the streets to counter that thinking. Uh, the same question, I think, to other panelists. I think uh, what needs to be done there's probably a, a significant degree of agreement between us. Uh, I, I think everyone would agree with what Prabhat had said, that we need uh, to massively expand uh, uh, demand by public spending, uh, both by putting money, uh, substantial amount of more money in the hands of the laboring poor and in infrastructure projects and so on and so forth, uh, which uh, you know, the question really is more, one more of political economy. Why is our government refusing uh, uh, refusing to take steps which would, would both uh, make life more bearable for the uh, survival of the laboring poor and would rescue the economy for all of us? So really, uh, it's more a question about what is, you know, why are we, what has brought us to this situation in terms of public policy choices? And why are we? Why is our government making these choices? Uh, Yon, you, uh, Yon Bremen, uh, you've been a critic, of course, consistently of, of of governments in the past as well. You've you've talked about how we've never built uh, a, a you know a, a structure of of, of well of welfare and of the protections of labour. Uh, so so in that background, how do you understand the political economy of of, of public policy choices that the government is making even at this moment? Well, Harsh, let me uh, reply to that uh, question by uh, saying a little bit about the situation in my own country. I'm talking to you from far away, yes. uh, sitting in a country and a society in which the laboring poor who are there, they are there very much so, uh, but they have voice. They have political uh, voice and assertion and uh, that climate of fear that uh, Prabhat uh, talked about is very important because uh, it seems that the laboring poor in India do not have political voice 
or even political representation. Uh, in my own country, there, there is also COVID-19, uh, no doubt about that. There has been a lockdown and life is coming back uh, slowly uh, and uh, uh, prudently because uh, the pandemic is not over. By no means is it over. But the pandemic in my country, uh, a well-to-do country, I must uh, say, uh, in, in the West, uh, the pandemic uh, happened in a situation in which both the level of the standard of living was much higher than in India has been uh, so far. And not only the standard of living was higher, it was also more proportionately divided than in India is the case. We have to understand the impact of the pandemic also as a progressive inequality instead of, uh, of uh, reducing uh, inequality by looking after, as uh, Mahatma Gandhi would have said, the last and the least. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, and that's what already has been said. Basically, the informal economy has become a black box. We do not know what is going on there. And there are just assumptions and estimates and guesstimates, I, uh, I should uh, say. We do not know the, the, the quantity of contraction. But the contraction is certainly much more than a quarter of GDP. Uh, it may uh, rise up to one third of uh, GDP, uh, as has also uh, been said. In my own country, the impact of the pandemic is a contraction of the economy by 8 to 10 percent. And that uh, proportion you will find uh, in most of the advanced economies. So what is very clear is that the 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 uh, the, the, the catching up, as they are so bravely called, the catching up economies, the developing nations, uh, are much more badly affected than the advanced countries and the disadvantaged countries, I should say. What is uh, noticeable also is that while this crisis is going on, all talk about sharing the wealth of the world more equally between the countries, the nations and the people uh, is out of fashion uh, these days. Uh, countries and societies look after their own concern. They are inwardly looking. There is no solidarity. Uh, I think that India is among the worst affected countries uh, also because the, the, the government seems to have washed its hands of the laboring poor. Uh, do not forget when we talk about hunger that according to the global hunger index already at the beginning of this year, India stood at the bottom of that ranking uh, at a position of 111 out of 127. That was the global uh, the position of the global labor index for India. And that has, uh, as has already been said, uh, become even worse than it was. Uh, so... There was not only a higher standard of living in my country, but also there was welfareism. There was the, 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 the concern that what happened in my economy basically affected the, those who were lesser educated, who earned less, who were, what shall I say, disadvantaged in the job market. That understanding is not there among the government in uh, India. And that has to do not only with the climate of fear, which leads to a kind of self-censorship, also for the laboring poor, also for the laboring poor, self-censorship. But uh, it is a situation in which uh, the, country, the government does not feel accountability to the laboring poor. It has no accountability, and by washing its hands, it also hides the condition of the laboring poor by not collecting data, by not collecting data on what is happening. And of course, there are a large number of civil uh, society uh, initiatives. Think of uh, Action Aid, think of Viego, uh, of, of, of SEVA. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, of civil uh, society uh, initiatives the problem is, 
government does not accept the figures and the estimates put forward by these voluntary agencies because they say we only rely on public data collected by official agencies but having destroyed the official agencies to collect the, uh, the, the, the data are not there. So the absence of information on what it means is progressive pauperization uh, of the laboring poor is not something that comes out of the blue. It is basically a scenario, a script, which is by being written by the government itself. By sweeping under the carpet the condition of the poor, the government seems to think that it can ignore what is happening uh, there. What all of us may may not sufficiently be aware of is the growing anger among the laboring poor of what is happening to them. them. When they were walking out of the cities, that was out of despair. No, no doubt about that. But it was also an act of resistance by walking away because they felt betrayed, they felt cheated by what was happening to them. Repairing to the countryside has not solved their problem, of course. And that has already been documented uh, fair enough and far uh, enough. But we should learn more. We should learn more about what is happening to the laboring poor in order to put it on public record. But when it is put on public record, it is not accepted by the government. That is the problem. Yeah, Jan, in fact, in the last part of the, the third part of the discussion, we really need to talk about how, in these circumstances, how can we force our government to act differently? And we'll come to that. But Renan, uh, may I come to you next? Um, the question that we're asking here is that the solutions are not complex to understand. Uh, and the solutions could have led to the relieving distress in the immediate run, but also protected the economy from its worst impacts. Why are we not making these political choices and these economic choices? How, what is your understanding of that? Renana, please. Um, Harsh, I, before I get to that, I just want to say something that you had mentioned, right. that uh, the progress uh, on food intake, what people keep reducing, and that at some point, uh, people will be going to sleep hungry. Um, I wanted to say it doesn't, it's not really, uh, unfortunately, there's very little information about that. But uh, what our survey show was that during the lockdown, the first three months or so, people were going to sleep hungry. Yes. There were many, many families um, who were going to sleep, uh, who maybe had one meal a day uh, and no more. And that was happening. Uh, and, you know, in the first two months, uh, the PDS system was supposed to distribute to everybody free, but it didn't. There were huge gaps. Uh, it was only in the third month that things got somewhat sorted out. Um, and even today, uh, it, it's much better than it was the first two months, but there are definitely big gaps of food, just basic food reaching the people. And also, you must realize that the PDS is only giving grain. So, uh, you know, just dry rotis is that what you would call uh, food. So I think, you know, we can't discount the level of hunger that happened during the lockdown. Um, so I just wanted to make that point. And that you know, if, I, if I could just, in, in, you know, add and supplement to it, you know, in some ways, it, you know, for the, for the homeless, we found it's even got worse because in Delhi, for instance, at least 10 lakh meals were being distributed. We were critical of the way people were made to stand in line all day, etc. But they were distributing 10 lakh meals. That has also stopped. Yes. And there's no employment opportunities. Yes, yes, so, uh, please go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and, and the, you know, there's no information or so on about that. And uh, going to statistics um, <clears throat> uh, and the kind of statistics government use, I just wanted to say I was on um, another webinar 
and somebody from the finance ministry was there and they were very proudly quoting a study by Dahlberg um, on how much of the government relief had actually reached people. Um, but uh, something like 96% of uh, food had reached 96% of the people and so on. Without mentioning when I actually went into the survey that 96% of people had got one time in four months, at least one time in four months. And um, similarly, the relief on cash transfers was actually very poor. The Jandhan, again, the, I don't have the exact figures, but large numbers did not get it. And who did get it was, you know, what is 500 rupees? Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, they are using statistics, but they're, uh, it's not that they're manufacturing, but they're um, actually conducting these surveys and then putting them out to show how good the relief has been totally ignoring so many other surveys. Uh, I want to make that point about statistics. Uh, I, <clears throat> you know, we're part of a joint action of trade unions. So all the trade unions have got together, except BMS for some reason, and um, uh, have been trying to, um, you know, make these statements, put demands and so on. And there were a number of demonstrations and uh, everybody, of course, got arrested. Um, and nobody knows about that, which brings me to the point that I really want to make. Why is it not happening? Why is this misery not coming out? Is the role of the media. The media is totally sold out, almost totally. There are a few exceptions. And uh, protests, uh, misery, all that, you don't see it at all. I mean, you see these terrible uh, things about, uh, uh, so what's his name, Sushant Singh Rajput and Priya Chakravarti and Kangana, Ra whatever, Ranaut. That's what's dominating the media. And uh, <clears throat> I remember reading this uh, thing on why India doesn't have famines anymore by Amartya Sen. And it's, it was because because of the publicity that goes along the media. And the media has stopped playing that role completely. Uh, it did a little bit during the migrant crisis. And that's when people came out and tried to help and all kinds of things happened. And now we've forgotten all that. So I, th I think what the media has done has, has desensitized, has dumbed down, has just killed any real... Um, debate and that is because the government has full control of this media. Um, so I th I'd like to say that. Finally, just to say that uh, one of the things that the crisis had revealed was the weakness of many of our social security systems, the extreme weakness of the social security systems. Um, perhaps it did bring out the strengths of the PDS system. Uh, somebody said Narega was doing well. I just saw a survey, and I am saying this also from my own experience. 10% um, of people uh, who have, of the migrants who've gone back, have received any money, are working on Narega at all. And I personally, and I know this will make me unpopular, but I personally believe that rather than Narega, we should have just put cash in the hands of people. So. Those are the things I wanted to say. I think many valuable points uh, about um, uh, you know invisible hunger on the role of the media, which has allowed the state to be protected from any kind of accountability. And what Amartya Sen had said that the media uh, plays a very important role to to prevent famine. I feel that the growing, creeping, scattered, invisible famine that is growing in our country has been made uh, more invisible by the media. And then also the weaknesses of our social security uh, systems. Um, uh, uh, Nagraj, uh, how would you like to you know, very briefly talk about, uh, you know, you had in your first uh, interventions talked about the things that the government did, uh, but clearly they were not enough. And why, what could 
why have they not done what needs to be done in your assessment? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I still try to figure out why government, uh, uh, why uh, government does not want to do it. I mean, uh, I think Prabhat had an uh, interesting argument that we are uh, we are scared of the of the power of the power of finance, you know, international global finance, and uh, and we are so sub sub subservient to the global finance that we do not want to raise our uh, voice or we don't want to take. A view which is, but you know, I would I, I would go a step further than what the Prabhat said. In fact, even IMF has said India has room for more public spending. Mm -hmm. In fact, even one of the uh, one of the leading uh, bond uh, rating agencies, uh, Moody's or S and P or one of those, even they have said that India has India has uh, more room to to spend. Uh, so of course they are very, uh, very, very carefully stated statement. But the fact that even they have said, but yet the government is unwilling to, to uh, uh, unwilling to uh, to heed to any of these voices, shows that there is something far deeper than the, the international financial, you know, fear. I think there is something more than that. What is that? You know, that's a, I think that's a very political question. You know, I think it's a it's an extremely you know, ideologically conservative government. I think that's the that's the only I mean, inference you know I can draw because it's it genuinely believes that you know that people should take care of themselves. I think you know when they say Atma Nirbhar, it's basically saying your life is your problem. I mean I'm being very blunt. Uh, I think uh, I think it genuinely believes when when the migrants are walking, they said it's it's your problem. Uh, so I think, you know, otherwise very interesting. I mean, I mean, uh, you may think I'm being uh, generous to the government. See, if if BJP wants to do social service, they can do it. I mean, they have in fact at the grassroots level, we all know. Many of you know better than I. They have enormous capabilities. Like I mean, in fact, I was talking to people. Uh, you know, where, you know, in in the Bhopal uh, tragedy in 1984. I am told I, I was never in near Bhopal that time, but I was told that the whole society came forward, including I mean the uh, civil society across political and the communal uh, whatever uh, divide. They all came together, together to help people who are affected. So I think even if the BJP decides to say, look, we have created lockdown, unprecedented lockdown, we must help. I think the grassroots of the party can do a lot more, but somehow, for some reason, they have not done it. This, I believe, has something to do with the deep ideology with the present regime is tied to. That's my uh, that, that's my inference. And that's the inference. That's the that's only. Um, yeah, I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Najat, I think I think that that it is an ideological position. Uh, a, 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 we're calling it uh, deep conservatism, uh, market fundamentalism uh, of of the government, uh, which stands in its way. Uh, you know, what you said about the Atmanirbhar, migrants have actually said this to me that Sarkar hame Atmanirbhar karna chahte matlab they're not going to do anything for us. We have to fend for ourselves. They they actually took the Prime Minister's uh, statement exactly, uh, you know, interpreted it in that way with a lot of bitterness. Uh, uh, because uh, you know, how do you see the political economy of uh, the choices that we are making, uh, which is rendering uh, the situation of the poor, the labouring poor, so 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 much more precarious than it needed to be? Miss, missing your voice, Vikas? Yeah, I would like to make two points. One is. To add to what uh, Prabhat and Nagaraj said, you know, I mean, there's no denying that there's a great need right now to to put money in the hands of people. Uh, but you know, uh, if you look at India's experience with in respect of anti-poverty programs from the 1980s, or you know, any sort of the whole range of social protection programs that India has experimented with over the last several decades. One thing that stands out very clearly is that programs which involve kind transfers, 
work the best. You know, PDS or food for work programs of the 1980s were the ones that, you know, really had a very significant impact on, on uh, alleviating poverty and distress. On the other hand, uh, programs which are, uh, which involve transfer of money, cash, you know, there is a greater problem of leakages, you know, whether it's RDP of the 1980s kind or, or, or other, or Jandhan Yojana of, uh, of today's uh, kind. This is not to say that there's no need to transfer uh, money right now in the hands. There is indeed a great need to transfer money right now in the hands of the people. But there is also a huge possibility of doing in-kind transfers beyond just providing the grain. I mean, why can't the state, for example, uh, say uh, every all dairy cooperatives will be provided 10 rupees per liter of milk that they procure on the condition that they will bring down the prices of milk, the retail prices of milk. Why can't they say that we are going to provide eggs to every child, every school going child, every Anganwadi going child or or, or, or women and so on, or milk, or or so many other things. You know, why can't you say, you know restart your midday meal program and say, okay, children can still come to school, get their midday meal, and go back home. You know, even if you don't want to do classroom teaching and so on, subject to following social distance, physical distancing norms and so on, you can surely provide nutrition. There are so many services where you can, why can't you just hire a large number of health workers, sanitation workers, and, uh, you know, Anganwadi workers to, to deal with a whole range of things, or teachers for that matter, tutors. You know, there, there, there's a huge possibility of providing goods and services to people, which would both go a long way in, the, in alleviating their distress, as well as generating huge amount of employment. So, you know, there are all kinds of possibilities of what the state should be doing. That's my first point. The second point I want to make is that we are living in a world in which the state is consciously manipulating data and we don't know what all it's doing. You see, on the 5th of May, we looked at data on NREGA work that was created in the month of April. It was the lowest in the last, in the entire history. It was the month with lowest level of employment generated in the entire history of the program. Okay. Now, then a month later, you go back and the data for April have been revised and a huge amount of general employment has suddenly appeared from nowhere. Now, please note that in during the lockdown, the exemption to NREGA, the letter, the notification which exempted NREGA from lockdown was issued only on 20th of April. On 20th of April, central government issued the notification. You know, that notification would have reached the states and then to the districts and, and tessils and so on. By the time you would have created work, the month was over. Now, how is it that so much work was created in the month of April? And if you actually go deep into the, the NREGA uh, MIS website, you find that there are several cases where much more than 10 days of work was generated in the month of April when there was a lockdown and there was no exemption for NREG work. In fact, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Pais and, and Baladan Nayadam have done uh, a statistically sort of sampled panchayats in Tamil Nadu, done a survey on how much work has been generated under, under NREG. And there are huge discrepancies between what is being reported on the website and what is actually happening on the ground. You know, I mean, it's perhaps, and the, the, I'm, I'm speculating a bit here, perhaps what is happening is that once a work is sanctioned, it's just recorded as having been done. Mm. You know, things yeah. of that kind, and we have no idea what is going on. There is zero transparency in this whole system of building of administrative statistics. We have no idea where these numbers are coming from, who's feeding these numbers into the website, what is being manipulated. These numbers are routinely revised to the convenience of the government, and we have zero uh, sense. You know, today you see something on the amount of employment that's generated on, in NREGA in the month of August. 15 days later, it will be a different number. You don't know what's going on and you cannot explain this. So, you know, I think we are living in a situation where access to information is really curtailed and anything that is problematic is routinely manipulated and punched. You know, yeah, that's the situation we are coming 
Because I, didn't, I, I don't think there's ever been a time when we, we have been able to trust our government uh, as little as, it, as we do today. Uh, you know, the, the data, the information, the prime minister's own words, uh, you know, whether it is on, on, on the China conflict, but whether it is on, on employment, whether it is on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on NREG or anything else, um, it's dealing with optics rather than with, with truth. You know, in this really desperate situation of, 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 of this massively growing uh, disaster, the last question, and I'm, I have my eye on the watch, and therefore I'd request short replies so that we can also answer uh, uh, some of the questions that our audience have, have raised. Uh, Anirban would be uh, uh, presenting those questions. My last question, uh, to which I need, which is the hardest question, is what needs to be done. There seems very little labor or civil society mobilization against the government, very little organized anger, little sustained political action by the, the opposition, and even less willingness of the government to heed our prescriptions. What can then be done to save our people from this massive growing disaster? You know, I, I, you know among other things, I wanted to draw your attention. There was a, 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 a lead uh, cover story by Time magazine uh, recently. Uh, where uh, where they describe you know one migrant worker's distress and all the suffering that he went through, uh, and at the end of the article they say that he, they asked him, uh, you know, with all his uh, anguish and anger, who are you going to vote for? And he immediately said Modi ji, and uh, and and then they actually he had spoken to me as well, and he had asked me why do I think this is happening? And I was saying that the only way I can understand this is that. Uh, we have been, you know, hate has been, is now like a drug that has, that has been injected into the veins of, of society in a way that we are intoxicated in this hate and in this intoxication, everything, even unemployment, even hunger is acceptable. I, I mean, there's something in the politics that, that, that we need to understand and we need to be able to fight. Uh, and what is it that we need to do for, for, people to, to have uh, you know, constructive anger uh, and mobilization uh, to make the government work for, 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 for the people of this country. Uh, what do we need to do? I, I think that, that, that's really a question. And uh, also when Nadra talked about conservatism, I worry about whether it's conservatism or it is really crony capitalism that we're talking about as well. Uh, is it subservience to finance for ideological reasons alone or, 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 or something more than that. And these are very hard, uh, difficult questions. So, uh, so where do we see hope for, for, for people mobilizing for change? And here I thought uh, just a, a minute or two each, uh, I'll go in the reverse order. Uh, Vikas, I'll start with you. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, I'll hand over to Ban for some of the audience questions. Vikas. Well, Harsh, I think, uh, there's also a positive side to, to what you said, you know, and I think we need to also recognize that and see how that can be built on. One is, so, you know, while, when the lockdown happened, you know, suddenly everybody was, was stuck and we didn't know what to do and so on. But, you know, if you look at the last two months, I don't think any week has gone when people have not been protesting. I mean, even today in Haryana, there have been a very large protest of, of, of farmers. Uh, two days back, uh, you know, farmers were protesting across the country. And this is something that's been happening throughout, you know, workers and peasants, I mean, with all the constraints, I mean, yes, I mean, it's not as much as it should have been. And there are problems in terms of how much we are able to mobilize. But, you know, uh, this is something that has been building and and uh, one is seeing greater and greater mobilization and i i hope this is something that uh, picks up more steam so so it is something that is happening and uh, uh, you know uh, there is a need to build this further and i i think that's possible the second thing i i mean i really uh, it's interesting you know you you made this point about uh, you know the hatred being the drug you know this is a country which you know came into being with that hatred 
uh, you know, I mean, we, you know, uh, we went through partition and all the violence that happened with partition, and then on that foundation built a secular, uh, secular country with with the constitution that we have, and and so on and so forth. So, I mean, uh, I do think that there is a possibility for the progressive forces uh, of this country to take the country in a different direction. To 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 you know uh, get this country out of this drug that has been uh, once again uh, fed to people and 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 change the course of history. I, we've done it before, and I think it's possible to do it again. In, inshallah, uh, uh, Nadra. Yeah, uh, I, I I'm happy to learn from Vikas that there are these farmers' protests going on, and I I I'm happy to but. My own impression uh, are something different when I do follow the uh, media. Uh, but what is surprising is even the organized workers, when their rights are being taken away, very little seems to be happening. I mean, I'll just give you one example. Recently, I wrote something up in the Hindu uh, newspaper, and uh, uh, somebody senior from Bangalore uh, uh, called me uh, in, the, in the government, called me and said, what you said is absolutely right. And he said there are workers are not protesting in very little protest only thing they are doing is workers uh, workers unions are filing cases in the uh, in the uh, in the courts uh, in the labor courts uh, against the dilution of uh, labor laws uh, but very very few of them are actually on the streets i mean this is about the supposedly the organized workers in bangalore city bangalore city is a history of uh, a trade union movement so that made me very, uh, very, I mean, very, very depressed. And you know, then I was wondering where, where are we heading. So I, I would love to share uh, Vikas's uh, uh, optimism. Or so, but as of today, uh, again, I was with some trade unions in Bombay. Again, I got a similar picture. Look, nothing much is happening. So I, I would love to share it. But I would like to believe that this is not happening at the ground level. But maybe. I, I don't have the uh, that sense of it. Uh, I be, I hope I'm wrong. Yeah, thank you. Mm. Yeah, uh, uh, I hope you're wrong as well, Prabhat. Yeah. Uh, you know, one thing this government has done is to really break up solidarities among people. In fact, not only has it broken up solidarities in the sense of putting against Muslims, against minorities, and so on. But it has actually atomized people. And this is something which uh, is a point where the interests of Hindutva and the interests of capital coincide, because capital hates having workers united in opposition to it. And, and, and that's why I always call, think of this government as a sort of corporate Hindutva alliance. And one of the achievements it has had is to really break up the resistance and break up the people. Now, to the extent, and, and you know, it is, it is that coming together of the people that actually makes even uh, parties with conservative ideologies yield ground. After all, the Tories are not people who particularly wanted a welfare state, but they find it very difficult to dismantle it because of the anger of the people. Now, I think these people, our, our current dispensation has really, uh, uh, you know, re gone beyond that kind of constraints. Because on the one hand, you cannot mobilize large numbers of people, partly because for the time being uh, uh, the kind of pandemic. But by the way, they were worried at the time of the anti-CAA protests, because that was one occasion when hundreds and thousands of people actually came together. Now, likewise, Vikas is, 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 is right. And, 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 I, and there is this de demonstration taking place by peasants everywhere. If there could be a million peasants in Delhi tomorrow, day after, in that case, the government will be forced to take cognizance of their problems, no matter what their ideology. So, so the point is that, you know, is the constraint of this kind, atomizing the people, making them into dispersed individuals who have nothing in common. Each of them then says, yes, I'm going to vote for Modi. 
each of them then actually sees his problem in complete isolation from, from everything else. That is number one. And number two, using Hindutva as a plank for mobilizing votes. And, you know, so, so, so it, all this has to be broken through collective action. And of course, uh, to the extent that Vikas uh, has his faith in the collective action taking place now, I suppose our only hope lies in carrying this forward, carrying this much further. And, 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 you know, this is where I think the trade unions, the left, the, 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 the voluntary organizations all have to come together to actually launch people's struggles. Yeah, sure. Uh, Renana, your quick point on this. Um, <laughs> Harsh, I'm quite pessimistic. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> I don't think um, that people are protesting in, or are feeling the need to protest mm. or feeling even that the government has done something wrong. They're suffering, um, but you know, it's not the government who's done something wrong. Maybe if I didn't get my PDS allotment or I didn't have a ration card and I didn't get it, it wasn't the government, it was the way that things are happening. And uh, I must, uh, so, so the government and you know, the act of God, uh, Nirmala Sitaraman's act of God, of course, uh, it came in on the GST context because they didn't want to honor the agreement. But uh, I do feel that that's, you know, it, that is what common people or normal people, at least our members, that it's all, the whole COVID crisis has really scared people. Maybe they say, why doesn't government help us more? But there's no huge feeling that all this is happening because of government. So I don't think that um, <clears throat> what is happening and what ha at least so far is going to lead to m many more protests. The, the farmers protest is against a particular action of the government with the APMC, allowing, uh, uh, restricting the APMCs. For, that's a very specific thing and the government may yield too, who knows? It's not a general um, Satisfaction. thing that things have gone terribly wrong. So, and that is going to happen. These kind of protests do happen and continue to happen on particular things that affect you at that particular time. And I'd just like to say, you know, everybody has such great faith in the trade unions. We've been working as a trade union and with organized sector trade unions for a long time. And the, it's not just this government, the power of the trade unions has decreased tremendously through direct reason for uh, as soon as uh, soon after liberalization started. So it didn't happen uh, yesterday or five years ago. It's been happening over the last 25 years. And the power of the trade unions is very low now very low. So um, not, and of course, we have this huge propaganda machine. And the propaganda machine is, uh, you know, downplays, as you rightly say, plays up the identity, your religious identity, and plays down your identity as a worker or as any other uh, being. So I I don't see I reasons to hope. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's, it's yeah. quite, no, no, I, quite pessimistic. We're all struggling with that. Jan, uh, you know, from a little distance, uh, with all your years of insight, uh, what do you think? I mean, where, uh, you know, how will things change? Well, uh, <clears throat> I'm not very optimistic, uh, of course. At the same time, uh, I think I'm realistic and I don't see uh, any political forces at work at the moment uh, who are able to uh, change the predicament of the laboring poor. Uh, what has been addressed in our uh, panel discussion is basically the role of the state. Uh, much more, and Prabhat has uh, said that already, than the role of capital uh, and of a kind of pre capital. For a uh, 
lifting up for emancipation, for social decency and dignity of the laboring poor, a broad acceptance of the principle of equality and equity, of social justice and tolerance is required. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be uh, lacking in the state at the moment. Those voices are there in society and we all come across them when we, wherever we move around and whenever we move around, but they don't seem to reach the parliament. They don't seem to reach the state. Uh, and that's a problem. Uh, that is a problem. Uh, another problem is that the politics of fear, of intimidation, of harassment, which lead also to a kind of self-censorship, not only among the intellectual class, but also among the laboring poor. What has been said in passing is also that the pandemic has uh, led to increased indebtedness of the laboring poor. And that makes for dependency. That does not make for counterfailing voices. So we should basically worry also over the lack of a combined opposition, political opposition, to the to the rule of the the the, the, the current set of power mongers uh, in the country at large, uh, which uh, they have a lot of of leverage in dictating their uh, agenda and there is not an attempt to organize the opposition in strong in strong voices as a countervailing power may i leave it at that uh, yes. um yeah I, I i think that we have to invent and strengthen a politics of solidarity. Uh, and that is truly the only way to fight uh, the economic crisis, the, the crisis of the laboring poor, and, and the crisis of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of fraternity uh, as well, uh, which we are facing. And what that politics of solidarity will be, how will we build it, I think has to preoccupy us uh, most of all. A couple of things. One, I, I think this question of why is corporate India still supporting this government, I think essentially because they think they are, this, this government is the best bet to, to extract whatever remains of the pie that, you know, a, a, a disproportionate amount of it goes to crony, crony capitalists. This, this regime is, is their best bet. So, so, so sure enough, uh, Ambani's and Adani's would, uh, would, would, would uh, go on with, with this regime. Uh, but you know, I it's just why have they got more, more enriched is also a question. But yes, exactly. This is the regime that would make sure that despite all this, they get more enriched, and 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 therefore, uh, you know, the the bulk of the 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 uh, what the government does in this situation actually ends up benefiting crony capitalists, the capitalists, and 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 so on. So 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 there's that. The, the, but you know, I think you know, one has to strike a balance between not becoming unrealistic and not becoming overly pessimistic. And I think uh, uh, one has to see, you know, uh, you know, there's no denying that there has been a setback in our ability to, to resist a regime of this kind, a regime that's divisive and destructive uh, insofar as uh, people's welfare is concerned. Uh, uh, that you know we are today weaker than than we were, but at the same time you know I think it's important to look at the the green shoots. It's important to see where we can build from and 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 uh, you know uh, work on that. I think uh, the point you made about the need for solidarities, and I I am reminded of you know that 
very important slogan that was used during the the CAA protests. You know, हम देश बचाने निकले हैं आओ हमारे साथ चलो. I think that's a slogan that needs to be uh, you know raised and and people have to come together and and uh, from, you know find how we want to you know uh, get back uh, this country. So so I think I'll just stop with that. I loved another slogan. Four words: You divide, we multiply. Uh, so that's that's really where where the hope lies. Then, Anna, we lost you. Uh, uh, would you like to come in? Uh, yeah, sorry, I sort of lost some connection there. Okay. <coughs> so, so um, you heard the questions, and I heard and, I heard uh, the two questions. Yes, I did hear the two and questions. And And I was just thinking on the uh, Bihar elections. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you know we do work in bihar and one of the <clears throat> i mean the main thing that is happening is that there is no really good opposition the rj rjd was the only real opposition and that is now quite divided uh, as you know <clears throat> they it's jailed lalu prasad um in order to prevent his Uh, he is the one with the uh, charisma uh, and so that's happened his family is divided rjd and um, <clears throat> there's i don't see huge disillusionment with the present sarkar so um is this going to the bihar migrants have come the thing that they were very upset about of course was some remarks that he made about uh migrants and not getting the migrants back but uh is <clears throat> and also what you said earlier uh the religious propaganda machine has really grown in bihar mm -hmm. i've seen it happen over the last uh five years seven years so uh, is it going to is something going to happen let's see it doesn't look very really likely <laughs> that's my the corporate sector one i don't really have it yeah. and um, yeah we still have to fight uh, to you know fight for solidarity i feel that that has to be the hope otherwise we lose everything and uh, sorry i'm being so i was quite pessimistic but right. i, I, I think <laughs> we have to have solidarity and that's what we've been trying to put together Yes. it's just that you know it's so much harder now than it was uh, even 10 years ago so it's but of course you do one does have to keep on trying and things change things happen uh, circumstances change so maybe things will completely change we don't know in in nagraj uh yeah i i agree you know the politics of solidarity is the, is the only way forward i agree we need to move forward uh, on that uh, and uh, yeah uh, about uh, why catalyst uh, i think uh, again the the question of fear is uh, i think very evident uh, in fact my interaction my very limited interaction with uh, the cross section of people from south bombay uh, and various uh, and some uh, industry associations uh there's a i mean what they say publicly and what they say privately is 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 completely different uh, and uh, so they are, many of them are uh, very much so it is true that a few select uh, conglomerates are the favorite of the of the present regime and they are they are multiplying i mean their assets and their the power is multiplying we all know but that doesn't represent the entire capitalist class uh, i mean i mean one can think of instances therefore i think the but when will the there will be a polarization and and that will have that will get reflected in politics i don't know it's difficult to say but I, so yeah, ultimately uh, business plays an important role in in politics and in every all know it so how will uh how will they affect uh, i don't know they, just like what happened during janata regime uh, you know when the at the, at the end of the uh, of the emergency and lots of businessmen back the janata party bp or you know what 
So when will that kind of a uh, turn will happen is anybody's guess at the moment. But to say that the entire capitalist class is together, uh, that I am not. But uh, it is true, some of them are enormously you know, getting up. Yeah. Uh, your closing comment. Uh, well, uh, this goes back to the, to the main problem we are discussing uh, in this uh, panel. Um, how to change the miserable predicament of the, of the laboring uh, poor. Uh, the problem is that in the current uh, setting of the economy, they are redundant to demand, it seems. They are uh, as a kind of reserve army of labor, which is not uh, continuously employed, often not employed, uh, and increasingly less employed. Uh, so many of the laboring poor are redundant to demand. And one can say, one can, that, that is also the problem of creating uh, solidarity. Solidarity is uh, also based on an, a joint interest, a common interest. It should be important to have the laboring poor along instead of uh, deporting them to the margins of society. It seems that the current uh, political regime uh, in India has been ideologically very successful uh, and it is uh, quite popular uh, still. Uh, that is also, uh, what shall I say, uh, a major barrier to creating uh, solidarity between the social classes. Uh, uh, while the current political regime has been quite successful ideologically, it has uh, miserably failed economically, and increasingly so. It's not only the laboring poor which is, uh, who are hurt, also the middle classes. It has not taken away their commitment, ideological commitment to the current regime, but they are also puzzled about the economic failure. And in order to change the plight of the, of the laboring poor, it is important to change their purchasing power, of course. Let us uh, for a moment uh, compare uh, India to China, where both nations were, let's say, 50 years ago, and where they are now. And however authoritarian and also repressive the government of China is today, common Chinese men, women, women and child, they have prospered under an economic regime which was focused on them, on creating welfare where welfare was missing, on adding to purchasing power where there was no purchasing power. In terms of poverty alleviation, the, 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 the record of the Chinese uh, government is impressive, of course. And in India, the current crisis, pandemic crisis, is even utilized by the political class to further cheapen the price of labor. To ask labor to work not eight hours, but to work 12 hours. Not to be paid overtime and no, having no labor rights. Well, that takes away all kinds of solidarities, uh, of course, not only between classes, but also between state and society. So as long as adding to the purchasing power of the laboring poor is not seen as economically very rational and very logical, as long that that does not happen, the price of labor in India will be further driven down. And that makes for, and that's what I began to say, not for poverty, but for pauperism. Uh, so friends, uh, we've overshot time a, a, a bit. I, my deep gratitude that all of you came here. It, it was a very somber discussion, uh, but I think that, uh, you know, some people ask, why did you, why do you invite people who are like-minded? I think like-minded people have to come together uh, to think uh, about uh, you know some of the biggest challenges of our times 
uh, and, and and seek answers. And in that spirit, all of you coming together in solidarity uh, was very valuable. Uh, I, I think that uh, we we will go back to many of the points that you spoke, and I hope we'll keep meeting again to make sense of our times. Uh, I just wanted to end with uh, you know where where do I see my optimism? Uh, uh, so Martin Luther King somewhere said that the arc of history is long, but in the end it bends towards justice. Uh, how long and when it, will it bend towards justice is something that I keep asking myself, but it will bend towards justice. And uh, Yopal Sartre, uh, uh, the French philosopher said, uh, you don't fight fascism because you will win. You fight fascism because it is fascism. And I think maybe maybe that's that has to be our biggest strength and resolve. So thank you all of you.